I'm recording. Are you recording? I'm recording. Are you on the tour? Yeah, okay, Doc. You want to do that? Yeah. Um, I might have to put the specs on. Guys, I need to uh, hold all this down. Let me figure out what this is. Seventeen to February 2013. Today is the Borough or Dampier Island. We pay our respects to past peoples of the Borough, ancient peoples who left their message for future generations. And some one million rock art and Harry of this. The oldest and largest we have known to ever exist on Earth. We pay our respects to many generations who over millennia assumed guardianship of what many regard the Australian original people as at this time. We stand in honour of the peaceful, unarmed, non-combative Yavuara people whose hand of friendship extended to the newly arrived colonists was grabbed with greed as colonists sought not merely the hand of friendship proffered, nor contentment with the arm, but a greed-driven desire to take the life out of the whole body of all the Yavuara people. Today we stand in honour of the Yavuara who were massacred in a three-month evil campaign today is the flying home massacre. It is because of this massacre that colonial Australian courts recently disallowed a native title claim, in effect rewarding the colonial society its rights to send for the flying home massacre. We honour those slain. We stand in solidarity. Excuse me. We stand in solidarity with the Nagata Gnarly Aboriginal people of West Pilbara, with the senior lawmen and spokesmen Wilfred Hicks and Tim Douglas, by whose consent this event takes place. We also acknowledge and act with the consent of tribal elder Audrey Cosmo. Idle No More Sydney, the Indigenous Social Justice Association, and Occupy Sydney join with the global stand up for the borough, supporters and friends in calling for UNESCO World Heritage listing of the entirety of the borough of Lockhart and its surrounding area. Recently, the West Australian Government gazetted 44% of the borough as a National Park Conservation Zone. This is the first response to requests, petitions, protests and negotiations for such conservation began in 1965 in response to acts of industrial destruction and wanton desecration. It is a small step in the right direction and for the first time gives UNESCO the scope to consider heritage listing, un listing under its charter. We call for the West Australian Government to extend all declared national park to all of the Dampier archipelago. To conserve 44% is the equivalent of Egypt preserving one pyramid knocking a second down to develop a high-rise building, <coughs> allowing the third to be converted into a hotel. It couldn't happen in Egypt, and it should happen in the oldest and the largest Paleolithic collection in the world. The fact that parts of the borough have already been destroyed to serve the short-term profit interests of mining and gas extractors from far away makes the prospect even more abhorrent. We note with considerable alarm recent comments by the Federal Environment Minister, Tony Burke, in relation to the Laird Forest, which he has sacrificed to serve the short-term interests of the coal miners. The Minister stated that while the area had significant environment, environmental significance, this should not be prioritised over jobs and industry. These are not the responsibilities of the Environment Minister, and we ask that the Minister is mindful of those responsibilities he applies his mind to the conservation of the Dampier Archipelago. We ask that he does so with urgency and that he conserve the entire area. The conservation of the Borough 
Lockhart will not prevent gas or mining operations. In fact, gas operators were leveraged by the West Australian Government to use an onshore gas hub as an alternate to the equally environmentally sensitive and contentious sacred Aboriginal site at James Price Point. Extractive operations put at risk the longer term tourism potential of this unique place which could drive significant employment and empowerment opportunities for local indigenous and non-indigenous communities. Today, we join with our brothers and sisters participating in this global stand-up for the borough in Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Canberra, Sydney and at the borough. The Maritime Union of Australia and its reports on Dandria Island and other places will observe a minute silence at their workplaces with our global family of supporters for the UNESCO World Heritage Listing for the borough. Today, I would like us all to observe a minute silence in memory of those who were slain at Flying Park. Want to say anything? I could read the last paragraph. Um, this is a short essay called The Killing Fields of Murrajuga by Robert G. Bednarik. Um, and it's too long to read in total, but he goes through blow by blow the succession of uh, massacres that occurred. Oh, right. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay. Um, thanks, buddy. In the interest of clarity, it seems requisite that some details concerning what is known about this incident may be available. The issue is related to the ineptness of successive governments of Western Australia in dealing with the massive rock art corpus of Muru Jugu and it seems relevant to consider how this government gained sovereignty over the land it now chooses to call Burrett Peninsula. The event took place supposedly at Fly Flying Foam Passage located to the north of Burrajuga on the 17th of February 1868. It was only one part of an extended campaign lasting through the rest of February and continuing into March and May 1868. The number that died in the entire campaign can only be conjectured it could have been anywhere in the order of 40 to 100, including those who may have perished subsequently due to injuries, starvation, or other circumstances induced directly by passengers. Perhaps, perhaps the most striking aspect of the Murujuga campaign is the almost complete absence of any captives. In fact, the only prisoners seem to have been men. Two were apprehended early but escaped, four were taken prison at the end of the campaign and two gave themselves up subsequently. So what was the fate of the women and children? 
it is not likely that they were perceived as a significant threat by the heavily armed Aussies. So why were they not spared and captured? Throughout Australia, the shortage of females in frontier regions led to the practice of, in quotes, recruiting Indigenous females. And the fact that the Mirajugu campaign was itself ignited, in fact, uh, the campaign was itself ignited by this very issue. The wholesale, that's because the police officer um, who um, initiated the um, dispute had actually, um, had actually, in effect, um, captured an Aboriginal woman and taken her, in, in quotes, into the bush. The wholesale killing of women and children in this campaign is therefore particularly important in understanding its agenda. I submit that this is a classic case of premeditated genocide and that it was committed not by rogue settlers taking the law into their own hands, but by police officers and special constables working in the service of the state of Western Australia. Therefore, this seems to be a prima facie case of the state-sanctioned intentional extermination of an entire division of the Nalu Luma people. The current claims of this government over the land, it's apportioning a century later of the land to various companies, its collection of royalties from these companies and its systematic destruction of the Yarrabura culture remains since. 1964 all need to be seen in this light. Not only do these claims need to be tested in an international court of law, there should be no doubt that the, the Naluma have a legitimate basis to seek compensation for the described action by servants of the state in 1868. Together with interest for the in intervening period, such material compensation should be quite substantial. In return, the community should also make reparation to the state by returning one small bag of flour that uh, an Aboriginal man was alleged to have stolen. That precipitated it as well. That was